Hey, YouTube, Mochismo Eugene again. This dude does not care about dress code, if there's such a thing. Anyway, just want to lightly apologize, but not apologize for a lot of the ways I'm dressed when I'm doing videos. It's sort of like, man, you know, no rhyme or reason, right? I was looking at some of my videos, but that's kind of who I am. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about, and I did this before a video, and it was regarding... Uh, don't run to the church, run to God. Uh, I'm going to talk similarly about that today. I was just taking a shower and I was thinking, man, you know, during the holidays coming up, Thanksgiving um, and Christmas you got going on. This is a time when people who are what you call communal narcissists, narcissists, communal narcissists or religious narcissists. Um, as you may or may not know, I met the narcissist, the covert narcissist in a church, at church. And uh, I was just taking my, my twins to church, you know, exposing them to uh, spiritual matters. Um, you know, I don't browbeat my kids about religion or God, but it's something innate to me because of things I've been through and uh, the blessings that I believe I received from God and the miracles that have happened in my life, which I'll probably talk about here or there. And you probably caught some of that in some of the other video just to come out of a narcissist, uh, narcissistic uh abusive relationship uh, that is the hand of God that is the hand of God because you gotta admit we didn't know about this we didn't see this coming we would have had no idea of a, such of e such an evil that exists we read about evils in the Bible and Revelation uh, we see in the Old Testament where you know people did things whereas they uh, uh, in the beginning where Cain and Abel he killed his own brother for the birthright simply because I guess the enviousness of of how the father looked at him over the other brother. And you go on and you see Joseph, he went through the same thing. Not not one brother tried to kill him, but four, three or four of them. They all uh, tried to sabotage his life, uh, threw him in a hole and went, ran and told the dad that he, he had got ravaged by wolves or lions or something. Then they soaked his coat of many colors in blood uh, as to uh, substantiate their lie. And it's amazing how when people lie, the lie itself is not enough. They have to add to it. They have to put blood on it in order to uh, make it convincing because, you know, it fools the brain. The father looks at the coat and he sees the blood on it. He's not going to be wise enough to say, man, you know, I don't think that's my son's blood. I think you guys soaked that in goat's blood or something and brought it to me with the illusion that my son has been killed. But in essence, you guys threw him in a hole because to throw somebody in a hole is, is, is uh, that was symbolic of how a person tries to get rid of you. They, they out of sight, out of mind, they try to um, just annihilate your existence. Uh, um, this one I met in the church, she got me fired from my job. You may say, well, how did she do that? I can tell you how I believe she did it through a smear campaign probably called randomly as an anonymous person and said some things such as, oh, he's talking bad about you guys at the job. Uh, and me mentioning certain guys that I held in high esteem, which was my boss, Ralph. I thought highly of him. Um, and a few other things about the job that I appreciated, they flip it and say, well, okay, he told me that he couldn't stand you. That's just an analogy or an example. Can you imagine how your goodness is being evil spoken of. This is what the Bible says. Don't have your good evil spoken of. But uh, the narcissist evil speaks about your nature, your existence, because what you have, they want. But they're not willing to go about doing what you do to get it. And in essence, how do you do it? You wake up and put one foot in front of the other. They can't do that because when they wake up, they have a distraction, a voice of sort, telling them that you're nothing. You ain't shit. If I can emphasize. Uh, so back to the point. The holidays are coming up. You're going to have Thanksgiving. You're going to sit around and you're going to feast on a meal. And I hope all of you empaths and survivors, you have a great Thanksgiving uh, and, and a better Christmas. Uh, I don't do the paganism as, 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 as most people do, whether you're religious or not. Uh, it's just, it, you know, we know that it's it's been dumbed down to... Uh, you know, dismissive. Oh, you know, the children, blah, 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 blah. 
most of us don't know why we we celebrate what we celebrate and if we do know we won't admit oh we celebrate christ as the coming of the savior or easter because that was a resurrection blah 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 so uh you know the, the argument is not for me to be uh having about whether these dates substantiate what i just said or not me as a believer i uh, acknowledge that you know Christ came, he did what he did, and uh, thank God he did it because I couldn't imagine a person doing what the Bible says this man did, and I don't see nobody walking the earth that can do that. But I think in in the fact that when God puts his spirit on you, you are a changed individual. And when you meet a narcissist, you are a changed individual again. So going to church, as I did growing up, I saw phony believers and I saw people who I believed and perceived were uh, legitimate, um, you know, just passionate, consistent, loyal to their faith. Uh, probably they, and, and some of them were just good at uh, pretending. They were masters at pretending. So a little bit of everything. So my bigger point is growing up, becoming an adult, making my mistakes, falling flat on my face after I've accepted God in my life shows me today at 52 years old that you know what you're undone every single day you wake up the only thing that causes you to move and exist is the grace the grace of god so the holidays are coming christmas thanksgiving stay away from the church and get closer to god i guess that's what this video is about get closer to god and we say well cal how do you do that you going to um you are going you're going to to the faith that you say you have, you're going to measure it by how much you are able to abstain from going to the physical building and how much you are willing to come closer to God in prayer, meditation, uh, just trying to listen to the inner voice of, uh, of God inside of you and, and reflect and introspect on your life your life only from the inside going out to how can you be a blessing to someone else in your life before new year's before the new year's resolution make that determination to do that now and, and by doing this i'm almost willing to believe without a doubt that if you do this draw away from the church the physical church and draw closer to god he says in the word, draw nigh to me, I'll draw nigh to you. And see, when you cry out to God in your secret place, without anybody around, patting you on the back, laying hands on you, and that's the thing too, don't let anybody lay hands on you because you're in the church. Don't even go up to the altar, uh, pray, at your, pray at, your, at your seat. People run around these churches putting their hands on you. Uh, I'll tell you not to be rude about it. You just you move to the side. You move from under their hand. You just move. Just move. We're not talking about offending somebody here because that's going to be had. If you stand in God and if you stand in your rightful place as a believer and you don't move off of other people's movement, you will be despised. You will be looked at with a stare. You will be uh ostracized people would distance themselves from you and that's for your benefit because when people distance themselves away from you you're able to see your life in a better perspective and because of all these distractions people go to church they put in their hour or two hours or three hours or four hours some of them stay there all day at the church and that one day and they come away thinking that they've done god a favor and i'm just here to tell you these holidays coming up the narcissist lurk around these places of homage they lurk around these places when you're giving off of yourself to something spiritual. And in this case, God, when you're giving praises to God, you're distracted away from world and you're distract, you, you, your focus is on God who you can't see. So you're in a meditation. Guess what the narcissist does? They want to come under their umbrella. They want to come out of the weather and come under your roof. Of, of, of refuge and safe haven. They want to come on and steal your blessings. Just like Cain, Abel situation, just like Joseph. They wanted to steal his blessing. And in order to steal their blessing, they got to get you out of the way. Because if they can get you out of the way, the focus of the giver is not on the, the one 
who's being given. Like Joseph was out of the way. They, in their mind, they thought I can get him out of the way. We going to be the benefit, beneficiaries of what he uh, rightfully ha uh, uh, deserves. We're going to get it now. What's rightfully due to him, we're going to get it. Because with him in the way, we can't get what he's getting. And that's how the narcissist will operate this Thanksgiving and Christmas. They will make sure they will be in your face they will hoover you. They will uh, they will come back around and temperature check you. What are you doing for Thanksgiving? What are you doing for Christmas? Because they're doing nothing. They're doing nothing. But what they are going to do, whatever comes out of your mouth, that's what they're going to do. I'll show you what a narcissist does. They'll ask you what you're going to do for Christmas or, or for Thanksgiving. And they will go on to have a conversation with the very next person. Because what you're doing, you're equipping them with, them with a conversation. Can you imagine? The narcissist never knows what to say at any given time. They don't have a, they don't have a personality. They adopt and steal pieces and parts of every human being that they come in contact with. So they're storing things. It's almost like where I work at. I have a notepad. And when I'm giving some data from the, the supervisors, I have to write it down and I have to go and search and find whatever it is I'm supposed to find. This is how a narcissist does. They have a pad, a notepad in their head. They systematically write down every conversation that they have or conversations that you have with them or they hear in passing. They eavesdrop, they over, uh, they, they eavesdrop and, um, Listen in on other people's conversation, whether they're at a restaurant, wherever, and they adopt that as their personality. That is how you should imagine a narcissist, because that is the stark truth of who they are. Left to themselves, that's why they can't be by themselves. They're not creative. They can't they can't create anything but but despair and destruction. Because they don't want to be around anything good and wholesome and peaceful for long periods of time that disturbs their movement, their way of how they're wired. Like you and I, healthy people who want to see the good in everybody, who want to present our best to people. We don't want to be looked at in any kind of bad light. So we do what we believe is moral. We do what we think is uh, respectful to other people. And if we have frustrations, we may verbalize those frustrations to someone and we communicate and we exchange our, our uh, disagreements. And this is how life works. But if a narcissist is offended, is offended they won't let you know verbally. They will, sh they will show you by their body language. But if you're not attuned, attuned to this, you won't even recognize what it is. You will know into what it's intuitively something just don't feel right but you pass it off you're going about your business this is before you were awakened your intuition still told you that something was off but now skipping fast forward you are aware but i'm going to tell you something about being aware you can you can still it's like brushing your teeth if you're not on top of your intuitiveness you can slack and you can get lax and a narcissist will creep in and do something to where you will dismiss it still. Don't, don't talk yourself out of what you believe and what you perceive. That's a measuring stick right there. If you perceive something, if you, your intuition tells you something within you that something is not right, doesn't feel right, ponder that. Ponder that for a while. Ponder that for the day. Uh, uh, however long you need to ponder it, but don't immediately dismiss it because guess what you're going to do? You're going to end up getting yourself entrapped in a situation that you could have otherwise avoided. They will have gotten in and insulated themselves or gotten a toehold or foot in edgewise with you. And so if you if you can understand where I'm trying to go with this, get away from the church, get closer to God. And if you're not a spiritual person, you don't believe in God. Um, I'm not here to, uh, to judge you on that, but I'm just talking in a sense where the holidays are coming up and a lot of us tend to go to church. We tend to go and put in our time at, at, at church for Thanksgiving or Christmas. 
It's just a traditional thing to do, and it's part of the matrix. Uh, you know, Terry Joel, he talks about uh, the matrix a lot. That guy's on point about everything he says, you know. Um, as disgruntled as he may sound to a lot of people, I get him because he's just, he, he's fed up with what we see in our world. It's disgusting, it is disturbing, and it basically puts you in a real, real agitated mood, and I get that. But sometimes you have to move, move in silence. Your silence can speak volumes. Um... Don't get drawn into the madness. Just observe the things that you're seeing happening in the world. We're not perfect. We're not going to ace it every time. There's a learning curve here. But I'm going to tell you something. This is a beautiful place to be as an empath, as a survivor of narcissistic personality disorder abuse. This is a beautiful place to be because guess what? We got a lot to say. We got a lot to talk about. We got a lot to give back to the world. We always did before, but we was giving it to the wrong energy. And that's important. You give your energy to the right places and don't exhaust your energy. Don't don't go to the extremes with giving your, your goodness away to other people. Sometimes the goodness that you possess, sometimes it's there for you to serve you. It's to serve you to keep your batteries charged so you can move on to the next level God's bringing you into. Just because you see a need, it doesn't mean you jump into that situation and fulfill that need. That's not what God wants you to do all the time. The reason why we are in the situation we were in because we were a tad bit zealous. We were a tad bit reckless. We were a tad bit too eager to uh, to help, to support, to provide, to be needed. And uh, I'm going to be, be honest. It's time for empaths to become a little more selfish than we've been in the past. And, if, and, and in a good way, if selfishness is a good thing. In a good way, with balance, you have to be selfish with your time. Because if you don't charge yourself up, you're no, you're no help to someone else. It's like a car. If you don't drive it in six months and it sits in the yard and you go and drive it, go to the store, and you see a guy needs to jump in the parking lot, and you say, oh, I'll jump your car. You go and jump his car, and you drive that car back home, and you park it. A couple of days go by, you go out to start it again. You can't go anywhere because you've depleted your battery. Now, that's the scenario because often the alternator will charge the battery. But if you're not going enough, if you're not doing enough driving your car, you, to your destination, thereby recharging your battery, your alternator is running, your car is recharging, you can't jumpstart the next person you have to have your battery up at peak performance your lifestyle has to be up here and even up here strive to go above and beyond where you are where you've been before and just do everything that you can do to protect you to be a healthy you to sustain yourself mentally emotionally intellectually spiritually and physically that's the five dimensions of wellness. So if you do this, you'll see your life, even when the narcissist come in and try to throw curves, you, you're not going to swing at them. You're not going to swing at them because you, you are aware that this thing that exists in our world is stronger than us. It's bigger than us. It's more powerful than us. In and of ourselves, we can't conquer and overcome it. But with awareness, they don't stand a chance. They're powerless. And just to stare and to, just to sit and observe narcissists often as I do. It is it is a very, very interesting um, interaction of sorts, because when you look at them and, and don't say much, they can't get anything. Nothing from nothing leaves nothing. If they can't extract from you. They can't temperature check you. They can't read your mood. They get restless and they don't want to be around that. Especially if they're over there bullshitting and shooting the job with someone else and telling them a bunch of deceitful lies. And you just kind of like, they think you're observing them because they're all that in a bag of chips. But you're kind of like looking almost like I'm looking now. 
with a somber look and you kind of just like they know or at least they perceive I haven't hoodwinked him I can't hoodwink this guy therefore does he know about me is he going to expose me so they abort mission and they move around what you've done is you've jumped into that moving bus and you've saved that person's life that they were trying to BS. You see how that worked? Didn't even have to say anything. Didn't have to tell them, hey, you know, that's a narcissist. Sometimes your silence speaks volume. You can just sit back. You can sit back and intercept. Intercept the disgusting, wretched, rotting corpse of a human being. They have a stench that you don't even want to be around. They have a stench that the morgue can't even compare to. God's not happy with them either. But like I say, don't let their mood, let your mood, uh, don't let your mood be bothered by them because a lot of times this is what they look for. They'll, they'll move on you even by your mood. You don't even have to speak. If they see and perceive you're in a mood of downtrodden, uh, existent, like you just, you got a low vibration. They pop up in your face like a jack in the box, like, hey, how you doing? And they'll go on and on and on with a conversation out of the blue. And they, you've never seen this person in your life. I do that. I engage with people sometimes, random strangers. If I'm in the line at the return desk or at the hardware store or something, or I'm just in line. I casually uh, converse because I don't want to be agitated waiting in line. You know, we get moody sometimes. We don't want to wait, but that's a different thing. Don't doubt some of the things you do that are normal as a human being and start thinking you're a narcissist because you do some of the things narcissists do. That's another thing, empath. When you first come out of this fog, that's what you'll tend to do. You'll walk back your behavior because you think you are a narcissist or you're behaving like a narcissist. Normal, healthy behavior, you stick to your guns. They steal healthy, normal behavior. I guess I made my point. I hope so. Bless.